And yes, we will be having question period. It is now time for question period. The member from Simcoe Gray on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we would like to stand down. On our lead questions at this time. Thank you. The member, the member from. It does go to. Point of order. We will be doing the same until the premier arrives. Thank you. Next rotation. It's not that. Uh, it's not that confusing. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Yesterday, we offered to participate in an all-party select committee to assist the government in finding $2 billion of savings across all ministries. We did that because we outrightly reject the concept that there should be $2 billion of additional taxation on families and businesses in this province. The New Democrats reject that as well, and we know today that the vast majority of Ontarians reject that. I'd like to know from the Minister of Finance, will he agree to accept our offer to form an all-party select committee Question. to assist him in finding the savings and efficiencies of $2 billion? Well, you know what? Let, let us start a conversation. Let us let us agree. Uh, I'm going to start a conversation. The interjections will stop. Minister, thank you. Let us agree to do this. Let us agree to pass the budget that talks about a very disciplined and determined measure to curb our spending. We're taking the steps necessary to ensure that spending remains below 1% year over year. As a result of those initiatives, we've been able to achieve over $5 billion in cuts over the last year to reduce our deficit projections. Next year's projection is going down by another billion dollars again because of those measures that we've taken. That is what is important. We need to ensure that going forward, we look, work collaboratively by passing this budget, ensuring that these proper steps are taken so that we Answer. tackle and eliminate the deficit by 2017 well, Speaker, the New Democrats have already confirmed that they'll pass the budget. We're going to vote against it because we don't, we do not, we do not believe that to increase spending by two billion dollars is a good start towards reducing spending. Order. And waste. Here's what I'm asking the Minister of Finance. Apart from the budget, which is a separate issue, we all know that there are at least billions of dollars of waste in this government every year. We, as the official opposition, want to extend our offer of support to form an all-party select committee to help find that waste so that we don't have to put $2 billion of additional taxes onto the backs of families and businesses Question. across the province. Will he accept that? You see it, please? Minister of Finance. We have taken extraordinary steps to transform the way government works, to find those savings, to ensure that we're delivering services in health care, in education, and all the other ministries that have taken extraordinary steps to reduce their spending. But we know that in health care and education, there are still pressures that are necessary because of the increasing demands. What is necessary as well, Mr. Speaker, is to be balanced in our approach. What is necessary is to stimulate economic growth and economic renewal by stimulating jobs and investments in our capital infrastructures. What is not necessary, Mr. Speaker, and what is harmful for economic renewal is a slash-and-burn policy, across-the-board cuts, a tax on, uh, on our nurses and our front lines is what they're offering. We're not going to stand for that, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We're going to invest in our future. We're going to invest in our young people. We're going to create jobs and stimulate growth, and that's what this budget is about. No question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. New Democrats FOI'd everything from the Premier's office, which included the words Project Vapor. We were told nothing existed. In the process, we received a sworn affidavit. It said the Premier's Chief of Staff, Chris Morley, had his email account deleted on June 21, 2012. And Jameson Stevie, the principal secretary, had his email account 
deleted August 17, 2012. And Sean Mullen, the Premier's energy adviser, had his email account deleted August 17, 2012. And then we learned in committee that the energy minister's chief of staff was deleting all his emails. Yesterday, Ontario's information commissioner said, quote, it's strange credulity that no one thought that they should maybe retain some of their emails. Can the minister explain why senior Liberal political staff Thank involved you. in the gas plants were deleting all their emails? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, point out to the House that the honourable member in his question forgot to point out that there were around 30,000 documents, many of them wow. from the Premier's office, that were recently delivered to the committee. In terms of the specific issues he raises, Mr. Speaker, he is correct. My understanding is that the Information and Privacy Commissioner is looking into the matter, and we await her report. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I can say, uh, as the Minister of Government Services, that we take our obligation to retain relevant records very seriously. Uh, training opportunities have been available for political staff as we enter into this new government phase, and we're certainly uh, making efforts to make sure that uh, the Answer. rules and regulations are being followed. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, New Democrats have asked the Information Commissioner to investigate. Your comment there is correct. In documents filed with the Information and Privacy Commission, the government tried to stop the Commissioner from looking at this. The government wrote, quote, the allegations about the destruction of records are not matters that may be appealed to the Commissioner. That response came March 5, 2013 long after this current Premier was sworn in. Why did the government, under this current Premier, not the previous one, continue to try and hide the destruction of documents and stop the Information Commissioner from getting information? Mr. Speaker, we have turned over 130,000 documents wow. to the Justice Committee, included, as I just referenced, 30,000 from the Premier's office. In terms of the uh, members, uh, the specific cases that the member raises, the committee itself has a mandate to look at the issue of documents and can pursue this matter, and the Information and Privacy Commissioner is looking into it, and we await her report. But as I said, Mr. Speaker, we take this matter very, very seriously, the retention of documents at the political staff level. Training uh, courses are underway, and I know ministers' offices have regimes in place to make sure that the rules are followed. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, in my riding of Ottawa Orleans, I often meet with families and listen to their concerns, like all members here. One concern that I frequently hear from parents is that they want to know, what, know that the right services and supports are in place for their child's development. This is a universal concern, and as a grandparent myself, I know that these types of services make positive impacts on the lives of our children. I know that in Ontario we are providing some of the best supports available anywhere in the world. My question, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell me what we are doing as a government to help children grow up to be healthy teenagers and then healthy adults? Good thank question. you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for his question. As he indicated, as a parent myself, nothing is more important to me than making sure all children are well prepared for life. Speaker, our ministry is investing $261 million annually in a myriad of programs for healthy child development. These supports include our early year centres, preschool speech and language programs, and Healthy Babies, Healthy Children. Healthy Babies and Healthy Children supports vulnerable mothers from the prenatal period through their child's transition to school. Through programs like this, we're able to directly assist in the healthy development of all young people. We remain committed, Speaker, to providing children with the best possible start in life. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer. It is very clear to me that this government takes the responsibility of, of uh, healthy childhood development seriously and is making a significant investment. However, this is an area where there is always an opportunity to make improvements. As a government, we need to be constantly looking to improve the services we provide while also seeking out new and improved methods 
I understand that in March of this year, a Healthy Kids panel released a report with recommendations to improve healthy childhood development, specifically with the goal of reducing childhood obesity. I am pleased that our government established this panel to help combat such an important issue. Can the minister please tell the House more about the report and how our government is responding? Mr. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Healthy Kids panel for their report, which aims to improve the health and well-being of children in our province. The report made recommendations on a number of vital Ministry of Children and Youth Services programs. These include the poverty reduction strategy, student nutrition, mental health and addictions. We are committed to reviewing the recommendations in order to inform our future direction. Minister Matthews and I will be co-chairing a working group on the Healthy Kids panel report. This working group will be essential in the effort to move towards this government's goal to improve early childhood de development services. We will continue to work with our partners and stakeholders in our commitment to improve the health and well-being of every child in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. Yeah. Minister, you have grossly mismanaged our jail systems in Ontario. You've closed jails in Walkerton, Owen Sound and Blue Water without enough capacity to safely absorb the inmates. Rather than fixing problem jails, you close them. Given your track record, people in my area think you have no interest in actually fixing the problems at EMDC. Many think you'll ignore the problems until you can officially close the jail. Minister, when do you intend to close the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. First of all, Mr. Speaker, let me thank all the uh, correctional officers here, and here. Uh, the staff at AMDC. Here, here. They're doing an extremely good job. It's not an easy job to, uh, to do. And I wanted to thank them uh, for all the good work that they're doing. The, as you know, Mr. Speaker, and as I said yesterday, the health and safety Order. of our staff in our correctional facility in EMDC is my utmost priority. And I know that they are always working in a very challenging environment. And actually, one of my first visits, as I, I was appointed Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services, was at EMDC. And I met the, uh, the leadership there, I met representatives Answer. from the correctional officer, and I saw firsthand you know, the good work that they are doing over there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Uh, minister, as you know, the situation in the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre came to a head last night. Correctional officers, insulted by your comments, locked down the jail. Two fires broke out. A green alert occurred, of which there have only been two in the past 22 years, and it was issued. And a number of inmates were reportedly sent to the hospital. The correctional officers at EMDC work day in and day out in dangerous conditions, conditions made worse by your mismanagement. Yet yesterday, you refused to take responsibility and instead threw, out, threw our frontline corrections officers under the bus and insulted all the managers around the province. There is absolutely no excuse for your failure on this file. Minister, will you admit that you have no credibility on this file, publicly apologize and resign? Seated, please. Uh, this is not the moment to add your interjections. Minister. Um. Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, you know, the health and safety of the uh, correctional officer and the staff at EMDC, it's my utmost priority. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. And if I offended someone yes. yesterday, I deeply apologize because that was not my intent. Since I was appointed uh, with uh, the responsibility of correctional services, I work very closely with my ministry, with our partners out there, with the union. Actually, I'm meeting the uh, union this afternoon and the executive of EMDC because I want to hear firsthand, you know, what is their concern, and I want us to work together to help to improve the situation in EMDC. I want to see a real difference in EMDC. Answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
stop the clock. To put us back on rotation, what I'll do is I'll go to the NDP for the two-question part, and then come back to the leader for the uh, primary questions, and then I'll come back to the leader of the third party for the primary questions. The member from London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, yesterday there was yet another emergency at the EMDC. A second fire in less than a month broke out and three inmates have been injured. Instead of working to address the persistent problems at this jail, the minister chose to blame the workers. For years, workers have brought up time and time again the problems at this facility. My leader, myself and other members in this House have brought this to her attention. Constantly. Minister, you have chosen to blame the workers who have done yeah. everything in their yeah. power to keep the jail functioning. Will the minister apologize to the workers for her thoughtless comments? Yeah. Minister. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank the, the member from London, Fanshawe. I know she has a keen interest in improving the situation there, and I have asked her, you know, to give me some name of. Uh, People, person who will be a good candidate to sit on the new board that I yeah. wanted to appoint to improve the situation there. I think that, uh, and as I said, you know, I'm meeting with the uh, ex executive of the, uh, the jail this afternoon, and I wanted to continue this uh, relationship um, to improve the situation out there. And again, if I uh, have uh, upset, if I have insulted, if I have, it was not my intent, and I deeply apologize. Thank you. Yep, very good. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, workers at EMDC have been raising issues about the safety of this jail for years, but little has changed, and the jail continues to be severely overcrowded and is a highly dangerous environment for workers and inmates alike. The minister's lack of action places the staff and inmates of EMDC in conditions herself she would not want to work in. I ask again, Mr. Speaker, will the minister apologize to the workers of EMDC and finally take action today to improve the conditions? And I'm not asking for an apology. I'm asking for the words, I am sorry. Minister. She's so, exactly so I that. think, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say it in French too, because I said it twice before. Alors, si je... So if I offended someone, I apologize. It was not an intent. I know that the situation is very difficult. The work is very hard, and those people they work very hard. In our uh, advancing our plan. So we are hiring 11 new full-time correctional officers. We, are, we have uh, implemented 24 hours nursing in March, and we, are adding, we have added in January a mental health nurse. We've hired three more operational managers, and we're building new control models. And also, they are, the correctional officer now can wear the safety vest. Uh, you know, they have this yeah. uh, opportunity now, and their safety is my utmost Thank priority. Thank you. Thank you. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition for primary questions. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is uh, to the, the Premier. Premier, later this morning, the Legislature will be voting on a budget motion um, asking us to uh, endorse the direction of your government uh, on fiscal issues. Uh, which includes uh, $20 billion more uh, in Order. debt. The deficit goes up, not down, and includes a billion dollars to buy the support of the NDP. Uh, Premier, before the legislature votes, I think it's important to ask you directly if you are confident that the credit rating agencies will not downgrade Ontario's credit rating as a result. Can you say with full confidence, Premier, who will not suffer yet another Liberal credit downgrade? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, and I, uh, I apologize for being late. I have a modest proposal for building transit in the GTHA, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. <laughs> I want to, uh, I want to thank the, the leader of the opposition for the question, and I, you know, I, I really believe that the budget that we have put forward is one that will spur the kind of job creation that we need in the province, Mr. Speaker. It focuses on creating the conditions for job creation, and it also, Mr. Speaker deals with the issues, addresses some of the issues that, uh, that affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And I think that the Leader of the, of the Opposition would be interested in that. In terms of the, uh, the bond rating,
Housing Agency. Um, DBRS, Mr. Speaker, has confirmed um, the uh, the rating. Uh, they acknowledged a solid bu solid budgetary performance achieved for the year ended March 31st, 2013. Ontario handily exceeded expectations in 2012-13, Mr. Speaker, and all trends Answer. remain stable. So that is the news that we got yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, I'm very confident that the budget that we put forward is fiscally responsible. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. The, the Premier did not express confidence that there won't be a further credit downgrade, which I think is of great concern. Um, the credit rating is a, a measure, uh, Premier, of the province's trustworthiness that will meet our obligations. Once a province loses that order, trust, Minister of the Environment, the come to that we saw in Europe, where their debt obligations grew, they had less money to put into essential services like hospitals, highways, or classrooms. Um, yesterday, the former Liberal Finance Minister Dwight Duncan expressed concern of a further credit downgrade. He said that the credit rating agencies will have stern words for you. I'll set aside the irony for a moment of Dwight Duncan talking about fiscal responsibility. But I'll ask you, Minister, uh, you've already, Premier, you've already had three credit downgrades under the previous finance minister. Can you assure the House 100 percent that we won't have a fourth as a result of this big budget? Thank you. Well, let's just say, let's just say, Mr. Speaker, that under the current finance minister, here's what DBRS is saying. While several provinces have delayed their fiscal recovery plans in response to weaker growth, Ontario continues to target a return to balance on its basis by 2017-18. go on to say, Mr. Speaker, given the recent trend of outperforming budget targets and reduced borrowing needs, the debt trajectory is encouraging. Mr. Speaker, we know we have, we know we have challenges ahead of us. We know that there are hills yet to climb, but we are on a responsible path, Mr. Speaker. We've had one confirmation of that. I am confident that we are going to be able to return to fiscal balance. We're going to be able to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, and that, Mr. Speaker, is what the market be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I say back to the Premier. You know that when Dwight Duncan is lecturing you on fiscal responsibility, you know you've got a big problem. We've uh, already seen, uh, you reference uh, DBRS, as you know, Premier, DBRS did downgrade the province's uh, credit rating, similarly through Moody's and Standards & Poor. Now, Speaker, Ontario families will have to actually pay the higher taxes the Premier is proposing uh, recently, increasing the HST, increasing the gas tax. Average Ontarians need to look out for their own credit rating. Uh, they make extraordinary efforts to protect that because it helps them get a mortgage to pay for a car to make sure they can finance their kids' education. So too should the province of Ontario treat that credit rating as sacrosanct and make sure you do everything to make sure we spend within our means because we owe that obligation to hardworking Ontarians who are seeing more money wasted under this government. I'll ask the Premier one last time, can she assure the legislature that her budget that's going to Question. drive off the debt not down, drive up the deficit, not down. Can you assure us we won't be hit with a fourth consecutive credit downgrade? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know that there will be, uh, there will be other news today from uh, another agency, but there was no downgrade yesterday, Mr. Speaker. We are on stable ground, according to DBRS yesterday, Mr. Speaker. So that is, that is good news for Ontario, and I would expect that the leader of the opposition of this great province would be celebrating that, would be saying that is a very good thing, that Ontario is, in, is on a solid track, Mr. Speaker. I will remind the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, that we are on track to balance by 2017-18 that we are the government that has put in place a long-term plan to reduce the debt to, the debt to D GDP, Mr. Speaker, and that Ontario is recognized as a safe and secure place to invest, and that is why we are attracting investment to the province. I have confidence in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Yep. I really wish that the Leader of the Opposition here, here. had that same confidence. Any question? A member from Whitby, Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, you have indicated that increasing home care services and achieving better value for health care dollars spent are top priorities. 
Community care access centres were established to award contracts to community nursing organisations and to assure value for money. However, recent actions taken by CCACs, with your government's approval, has actually moved Ontario in the opposite direction. Higher costs for less service. CEO salaries have been allowed to skyrocket, and the conflict of interest set up by the direct provision of home care services by CCACs has increased costs to the point that only 60 per cent of health care dollars are actually spent on frontline services. CCAC staff have increased by 10 per cent, but the provision of services to individuals has actually decreased by, has only increased by 5 per cent. Premier, how can you possibly claim that you've increased home care services and value for money when the evidence clearly shows the opposite? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Health will want to speak to some of the specifics, but I was in London last week, Mr. Speaker, and we had the opportunity, Minister Matthews and I had the opportunity to, to visit a family uh, who are at home getting the care that they need, Mr. Speaker, because the CCAC has been able to coordinate that care. And one of the things that is happening, Mr. Speaker, is that coordination of all of the partners who deliver service on the front line and the CCAC providing that kind of coordination, Mr. Speaker. So I, I honestly don't know exactly the specifics that the uh, member opposite is, is speaking to, but what I do know is that there are more people getting more care in the province than there has been over the past decade, Mr. Speaker. What I do know is that we have committed $185 Answer. million more dollars, Mr. Speaker, to provide for more home care and in addition to that mr speaker more community care which is exactly what families need thank you supplementary well mr speaker you know what's really sad about this is they actually there's been an increase in funding but there isn't an increase in service and i'm sure that we all hear from people in our constituencies about thousands of people still on wait care lists but let's talk about where the money is actually going the salary for the central CCAC CEO went from 180,000 in 2009 to 272,000 in 2012. The salary for the Erie St. Clair CEO went from 169,000 to 221,000, and the Hamilton Niagara CEO salary increased from 213,000 to 266,000. Mr. Wow. Speaker, the Great list goes working. on yes. and on and on. Premier, again, how can you possibly claim that you're increasing home care services when we have this kind of scandalous spending going on? Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, <laughs> the reality is that the kind of care that people are getting, and and you know, we were in the Patterson's home last week, and it's about the care that people are getting actually in their home, but it's also about the community Order. care. So, for example, the day programs, Mr. Speaker, that allow people who need that kind of support at home to go during the day to a program that is that is supported by the, the government, from Renfrew, Mr. Come Speaker, to order. and allows the the caregiver at home to have Storm that respite. On. So, there's a there's a complex web of supports that need to be in place, Mr. Speaker. know is that the CCAC provides the coordination of that kind of care, and they provide it from the time a person is, is in hospital, Mr. Speaker, until they get that support and they start, yes, they start to, uh, to heal at home. So I am convinced, Mr. Speaker, that the health care system is undergoing a Thank transformation you. that is providing more care for people in Thank their you. communities. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, what it should be about is getting more money to frontline service, and that's not what we're seeing happening. And certainly another complicating factor is the direct provision of home care services by the CCACs. It's a clear conflict of interest because the CCAC is the oversight body that awards the contracts to nursing providers, but now it's competing with the very organizations it's supposed to fund. The RNAO, Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, pointed this out in their recent report. They stated, and I quote, programs suggest that the CCACs are taking on a more direct care role, which was not their intended purpose. The CCAC system does not possess the structure, mandate, or capacity to deliver direct care to Ontarians. Moreover, this inappropriate function of the CCAC is destabilizing the community care workforce. Mr. Speaker, Question. instead of delivering more frontline services, evidence clearly shows that they're simply building a larger bureaucracy. Community care organizations dare not speak up against this because the Thank CCACs you. are the ones that award this work. Minister, Thank our you. Premier, what will you do to end this?
Thank you. Well, Speaker, I could tell you one thing. I will not be taking lessons on how to deliver high-quality health care from the party opposite. Their record speaks for itself. When they were in charge, Speaker, we— That'll, uh, that'll do. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, when they were in power, they cut home care services to seniors, 22 per cent cut in nursing, 30 per cent in home making services between 2001 and 2003, and their current white paper calls for the firing of 10,000 nurses. Speaker, these people don't know what they're talking about. I uh, stop the clock. Coming from both sides, it's very difficult to try to get that individual, but I have them in my head, and if I hear it again, I'll go right at them. Finish, please. Speaker, if the, if the Conservatives genuinely cared about improving home care in this province, they would be supporting the, member the budget from Cambridge that come to order. expands home care services to the people who need it the most in this province. Thank you. Um, to bring clarity, uh, I will go to the uh, leader of the third party for the primary questions, and after that, the rest of the rotation comes back to the government side. The leader of the third party. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians have told us that they need some relief. Their bills are going up, but their paychecks aren't keeping up. That's why we called for a 15 per cent reduction in auto insurance premiums. But people are worried that insurance companies are raising rates before any reductions. What does the Premier have to say to drivers who are concerned that they won't get the relief that they need and deserve? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I, what I would say to drivers is that we agree with the, the leader of the third party that we need to do something about auto insurance premiums, which is why we were interested in acting on that. The NDP had a specific suggestion. We have, we have committed to doing that, and it is part of our budget proposal, Mr. Speaker. So we want to get the budget passed. We want to work on getting the fraud out of the system, get, finding those savings, and that, that savings being passed on to premium holders, Mr. Speaker. We've made a commitment to do that in the budget, so we look forward to getting the budget through the legislative process so that we can begin to implement it, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier did listen to New Democrats, and she promised Ontarians that she'll drop auto insurance premiums by 15 per cent. But we've been hearing from drivers, Speaker, who have received notices, recently notices, of double-digit increases in their premiums. Ontarians want to know that the government will square that circle, Speaker. What concrete steps will the Premier take to ensure that premiums go down like she promised? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, that plan is laid out in the budget. We have committed to an average reduction of 15 per cent across the province, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, it is an average, and, and we have to be clear that that doesn't mean that everyone will get an absolute 15 per cent reduction, and that was never, that was never the commitment on by either party. So it's in our budget, Mr. Speaker. We want to get the budget passed. This one situation that the leader of the third party has raised. From Hamilton East Stony Creek, please come to order. The situation that the leader of the third party has raised, I cannot comment on, but I know that the Minister of Finance has spoken with the industry, Mr. Speaker. It is not our intention that there would be undue increases as we work up to the, uh, the passage of the budget, but we do need to get the budget Answer. passed in order to be able to implement it. Okay, thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, yesterday, the Finance Minister said, quote, we've been very direct in telling the insurance companies to maintain the rates at what they are, unquote. But New Democrats are hearing from drivers, not just the woman that was here yesterday, but dozens of drivers who are getting big increases, big increases in their premiums. Will the Premier take action today to ensure that rates are maintained as they are while we put the tools in place to start bringing them down? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the way averages work is that some go up and some go down and some stay the same, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that we could we could come up with lists of people who have had reductions in auto insurance. We could come up with lists of people who have had some increases in auto insurance and some for whom their premiums have stayed the same. What we have said is that overall 
We believe there should be a reduction of premiums. We have said we have committed to a 15 per cent average reduction across the board, Mr. Speaker, and in order to be able to begin to implement our plan, we need to get the budget passed. So I look forward to the support of the third party so we can do that and we can begin to implement those changes. My next question is for the Premier as well, Speaker. Real investment in transit and transportation infrastructure is going to take long-term planning. In fact, Metrolinx estimates it will take 25 years of investment. The government's done its own long-term planning and has made it clear that they plan to cancel the fairness tax on high-income earners as soon as Ontario's books are balanced. If the government's worried about funding, Speaker, can the Premier explain why she's planning a tax cut for people making over $500,000 a year? Wow. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, um, again, at the root of this question is uh, an intention to undermine the notion that we have to build transit in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, Mr. Speaker. There should be no debate about that. It should be very clear to anyone who is in touch with constituents who live in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area that we must do something about investment in transit for the next generation. It would be irresponsible of us, Mr. Speaker, as a collective to ignore this issue because if we believe that the economy of the province is driven to some extent by this region, Mr. Speaker, then we know that moving goods and people around this region has to improve. So, I reject the notion that we not move yes, ahead sir. on building transit, Mr. Speaker. In terms of the tax regime, I will speak to that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what uh, the Premier wants to do is undermine families who are having a hard time uh, making uh, ends meet these days in Ontario while they give huge breaks to the people at the very top of the income scale in Ontario. New Democrats don't think that that's fair, Speaker. In addition to opening new tax loopholes that are going to allow corporations to get the HST off of their expenses like gasoline, the government said their first priority, as soon as the books are balanced, is more corporate tax giveaways. Speaker. If the Premier believes that Ontario needs long-term investment for infrastructure, can she explain why she has made corporate tax giveaways worth billions of dollars a priority? Premier. So, <laughs> what I believe and what my team believes, Mr. Speaker, is that we must have a thriving economy. And what that means is businesses must be competitive with our neighboring jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. We must be able to attract investment to Ontario. This has to be a place where investment wants to come so that businesses can grow. And what businesses need, in addition to that kind of competitive tax regime, Mr. Speaker, they need the infrastructure in place so that they can move their goods across the GTHA, so that they can bring people to this region to live and work in those industries, Mr. Great Speaker, jobs. because people want to be here, they want to raise their families here, because it doesn't take them two hours to get their kids to school or to daycare or to get themselves to work. So we're going to work on both fronts because it's a complex Answer. issue. We're going to work to make sure that the conditions are in place for business to come here, and we're going to invest in transit, Mr. Speaker, so that we can grow the economy. The final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, what I believe and what New Democrats believe is that we need a fair economy in the province of Ontario. Just a few short months ago, Speaker, one transit expert said this, and I quote, we need to ask less of those who can afford less and more from those who are getting the greatest benefit for transportation uh, investment, the private sector. Unquote. Quoting again, lots of people are calling for an adult conversation about road pricing and even regional sales taxes. I do not think Ontario families should pay more right now in the GTHA. That expert speaker, the Premier should know, is sitting kind of right behind her as the Cabinet Minister now for the uh, Minister of Transportation. Explain to him then, and to all of us, Question. why the government is open to new taxes for Ontario families at the same time they're planning to cut taxes for Ontario's wealthiest individuals and largest corporations. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, if the leader of the third party thinks it is fair 
for a single parent to have to get their kids up at 5.30 in the morning in order to get them to daycare so that they can get their, to their job because they live in the 905 and they're coming into the 4, 416 to work, Mr. Speaker. If the leader of the third party thinks that that is fair, I disagree. I disagree categorically that it is fair for us as a government to neglect our responsibility. That has been neglected for at least a generation, Mr. Speaker. We started building transit when we came into office in 2003, but before that, Mr. Speaker, there had been at least a decade of neglect on this file. And so if the leader of the third party thinks that that neglect should continue, we're just going to have to agree to disagree, Mr. Speaker, because I think those investments are necessary for the families of this constituency. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated. New question, the member from Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, with the warm weather slow, finally, very slowly coming, it's really nice to see baseball diamonds and soccer fields in my riding brimming with children. In fact, it's really nice to just see children outside playing, whether they're just playing tag or are they on their bicycles. And that's because parents realize today that it's important that our children lead an active life. But one thing that parents are concerned about is injury while our children are playing, especially serious injuries like concussions. Can the minister tell my constituents in the riding of Mississauga East Cooksville what this government's plan is for injury prevention? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker. I'm happy to answer the question from the Honourable Member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Speaker, this week marks Save Kids Week. As I mentioned earlier today, we're welcoming Parents to Canada to Queen's Park, and this year, they are recognizing the importance of sport safety and concussion prevention. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of Ontarians being active in sport and recreation. Since 2003, we have invested over $750 million to support sport and recreation programs, and we are eagerly committed to injury prevention. This is why we are working with Coaching Association of Ontario to develop and expand concussion management education opportunities for Ontario coaches. Speaker, we are also Answer. working with provincial and multi-sport organizations to ensure concussion protocols are developed for young athletes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that a great answer, and it's really good to see that the safety of our children continues to be a priority for this government. Absolutely. Now, Speaker, it, sometimes it can be a little bit challenging for families to make sure that they're physically active. It costs money, and you need places to be able to be active. So I'd like to know what this government is doing to help ensure that Ontarians have access to extracurricular and sports activities. That's a perfect question. Good question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you for your question again. I'm pleased to say that the successful expansion of the R2 school program have enabled children to not only participate in a safe environment, but also increase overall physical. Speaker, the program now provides over 20,000 opportunities in more than 389 locations across Ontario. We want our province to be healthy, prosperous, place to live, work and play. Speaker. We provided over 23 million to our sport partners in 2012 to 13 to promote participation and excellence in sport across our beautiful province. Through our investments, we are contributing to an Ontario that is both safer for kids and encourages them to get more involved and yes, active sir. overall. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Privacy Commissioner expressed a very dim view of the actions of former senior staff in the Premier's office. The email accounts of three of the Premier's former staffers, including the Chief of Staff, Order. no longer exist and can't be recovered. This despite a legal requirement to keep all those records for five years. Now, this doesn't happen by accident. It takes a deliberate act to make that happen. The commissioner said it, quote, strained credulity that they wouldn't know they were to retain those emails. So, Premier, those emails are critical 
to the Justice Committee's investigation into your gas plant scandal. Would you please tell us was, what was in those emails so that we can get to the bottom of the scandal? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, you know, I can only repeat what I said to uh, the uh, honourable member from the New Democratic Party. I believe at uh, present we have uh, provided the committee 131,222. Wow. That's an approximate number. PC documents that have gone for that have gone forward with close to 30,000 from the uh, the premier's office. The uh, member is raising an investigation that's going on by the Information and Privacy Commissioner, who's an officer of this. House. We look forward to receiving her report. In terms Rebel of uh, the regime that we have in place for political staff, particularly the new ones who have come forward in this uh, a new government, we have had a, a, a training session across the board. We've also had individual training fine. sessions yeah, so that they understand their responsibility. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, that's even more proof that even a high horse uh, produces manure. <laughs> Premier, two Liberal staffers have even. I, I have to tell the member I'm not uh, overly impressed with that, and the tenor of what, what was said is not acceptable. But I'll allow the member to decide if he wants to withdraw himself. Speaker, I will withdraw. Thank you. Uh, Premier, two Liberal staffers have even more explaining to do for the deleted and destroyed emails. Craig McLennan, uh, the former Energy Chief of Staff and now a plum appointment at o uh, OLG, and Sean Mullen, the former policy advisor to the Premier, swore under right. oath they were screened off the file in April of 2011. Yet we presented emails yesterday that shows McLennan and Mullen deeply involved in the Oakville matters late into May and June of 2011. Conveniently, Mullen's email account is missing, and McLennan admitted to Question. the committee he deleted his emails. Premier, can you tell Ontarians what exactly are you hiding in these emails? What are you hiding? Mr. Speaker, uh, the witnesses in question, they come before the committee, they testify under oath in good faith. These are matters to be left to the committee. But you know, Mr. Speaker, there is a bigger issue here, and that is why the Progressive Conservative Party seems to conveniently forget that they opposed the gas plants in the last election, Mr. Speaker, to the point the where their candidate, Mr. Speaker, had robocalls that were out there there against it. And Mr. Speaker, I know that the Progressive Conservative Party probably regrets those robocalls. They have 85,000 reasons to regret robocalls. But the fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is that was part of the campaign. Why will their candidates not come before the committee? Why will they not talk about their costing? Mr. Speaker, why are they pushing this whole committee matter, this whole subject matter to the side, Mr. Speaker? What did they have to hide? Thank you. New questions? The member from Nickelodeon. Thank you. A question to the Prime Premier. A busload of people made the trip from Kingston to Queen's Park because they want you to listen to them and to the thousands of people in their community. They are here to tell you that they do not want their new hospital to be a public-private partnership. They do not want it to be a P3. Research has shown us that P3 hospital costs 16 percent more than conventionally tendered hospital. The residents of Kingston want their health care dollars spent on health care, not funneled to the bank accounts of private for-profit companies, most of them offshore. My question is simple. Will the Premier listen to the people of Kingston and stop the wrong-headed P3 plan for their hospitals? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, I we have had the opportunity to speak to a number of the, the people in Kingston who, uh, who are concerned about this. What I have heard overwhelmingly, Mr. Speaker, is that the people of Kingston want this hospital to be built. They want the hospital to be built. And they want, they want the hospital to be publicly owned, which it will be, Mr. Speaker. It will be a publicly owned institution. So, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we need to get this piece of this important piece of infrastructure built. We are doing everything in our power to do that, Mr. Speaker, and I can assure the people of Kingston that this will remain a public institution. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, the people of Kingston have seen what happens when a hospital is a P3. They have seen wasted taxpayers' dollars, 
They have seen dirty hospitals. From they have seen cuts to patient care. They have seen broken promises. In April, 10,000 of them came out for a vote to tell you that stop the P3 hospital. I have their ballots with me. I will deliver cases of them, 10,000 of them, to you. Premier, hospitals only succeed when they have the support of their community. And right now, the people are telling you you are setting up this new hospital to fail. I ask again, will the Premier listen to the people of Kingston who came here today? Will the Premier listen to the 10,000 people who Question. take the time to vote? Will the Premier listen to the thousands more who want you to stop this wrong-headed P3 plan? Will Thank the you. Premier listen? Speaker, the, the people of Kingston very clearly want this hospital be, to be built, and they want it to be built now. If, if they don't want a P3 hospital or an AFP model, they can wait, Speaker, they can wait for a long, long time. If they want the hospital built now, this is the model under which we can build it now. We're replacing, Speaker, a hospital that is over 100 years old. This hospital will provide much better care for the people who need access to it. Speaker, the Sisters of Providence, I've met with the Sisters of Providence. They are delighted that we're moving forward with this. And, Speaker, if it's good enough for the Sisters of Providence, if the Sisters of Providence support this, then I am very proud to support it, too. Thank you. Your question, the member from North, North South Western. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Last month, the Minister announced changes to physiotherapy services in Ontario that will be implemented this summer. Many seniors in my riding of York Southwestern uh, have been expressing concerns about these changes. They are being told that they will no longer be able to access physiotherapy and exercise classes in, communi in the community or in their retirement retirement homes, and many have heard that physiotherapy will now be capped at 12 sessions down from 150. Speaker, could the minister please explain what these changes will mean for Ontarians who need physiotherapy services? Thank you, Minister. Well, Welcome thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very important question. I welcome the opportunity, opportunity to debunk some of the myths that are being spread by those who have a vested interest in the current model, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The changes we're making to physiotherapy will expand, significantly expand yeah. access to exercise classes, falls prevention classes, and individual for. physiotherapy. We're doing this, Speaker, because the seniors of this province are depending on us to provide the best possible care. Let me be clear. Be clear. Eligibility will remain the same. Seniors are, cover, who, seniors are covered today. They will, be con they will continue to be covered under the new model. 218,000 more Ontarians will be able to access this government-funded uh, uh, program, Speaker. Exercise and falls prevention classes Answer. will be offered in the community and in retirement homes across the province. The classes are not being cut. They are being expanded. There will be no cap on the number Thank of, of uh, services people may receive, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, uh, thank you, Minister. Speaker, uh, many seniors will be relieved that uh, their services are not being cut, and many more will be encouraged by the fact that they should be expanded. However, some seniors in uh, my riding in, in York South West, and I'm sure across Ontario, are being told that the government is cutting funding on physiotherapy services. They are also being told that current providers can offer these services to housebound seniors at a lower cost than community care access censored word under the new plan. So, Speaker, could the minister tell us if these claims are true? Minister. So, Speaker, let me be clear. There will be no cap on the number of physiotherapy services that people can get if they need them, Speaker. There will be many more locations from which uh, these uh, people can choose where they want to uh, receive it. Speaker, the fact is we're increasing the budget for physiotherapy exercise and falls prevention classes from $146 million to $156 million a year. It is not true that current providers can offer this service at a lower cost. Under the, uh, under the old model, through CCACs, last year, the, their average cost was $750 per client.
compared to the CCAC average of $80. Under the old system, costs are increasing at an unsustainable rate, and, and, and uh, care is uneven across the province. Answer. The changes that we're introducing will allow us to off offer exercise classes, falls prevention classes, and high-quality one-on-one physiotherapy to twice as many Ontarians in the community. I'm committed to doing the right thing, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, today I will be tabling my private member's bill titled Fairness is a Two-Way Street Act. This bill will shut the door on Quebec construction workers and contractors coming into Ontario. In spite of countless agreements between Ontario and Quebec, Ontario construction contractors and workers have been virtually forbidden from working in the province of Quebec. Well, Quebecers have had completely unfettered access to the Eastern Ontario construction market. Order. Ontarians, in, Ontarians believe in Minister open borders, the environment. but they are being taken advantage of and ultimately losing good jobs without equal access. Minister. Do you believe that working men and women in eastern Ontario Western. are getting fair access to the Quebec job market? Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And let me first thank the member opposite uh, for bringing forward this issue. We had, uh, I want to thank the member for reaching out to me, and we had, uh, had an opportunity to sit down yesterday and talk about his bill. And Look forward to the introduction of the bill and reviewing it. And I've uh, I've said to the member opposite that we will uh, we'll work together. I, I, Speaker, one thing was clear from our conversation yesterday that uh, both our, our goals are aligned, and that is to create more good jobs for Ontarians. And Speaker, no government has done more to create jobs uh, for Ontarians. The kind of investments we have made and continue to make in our universities and colleges, schools and hospitals and community sectors, billions of dollars, have resulted in, in good construction jobs uh, for Ontarians. Speaker, Ontarians deserve a fair shot at competing for work in other jurisdictions, and that's what I and this Answer. government will fight for. But, Speaker, in order to ensure that, what we need to do is focus on fixing the problems but not creating new ones, and I look forward to speaking further in my supplementary to the member's question. Jack. I'll wait for that to, to give you the supplementary so you can hear my response. Supplementary. Minister, the original Fairness is a Two-Way Street Act became law in 1999 to solve this worker mobility problem with Quebec. It was repealed in 2006 when the government signed the Agreement on Labour Mobility between Ontario Who and Quebec. That? Who repealed that? Since 2006, Quebec has gone back to their old ways of creating mountains of red tape and harassment activities that? that effectively shut Ontario contractors and workers out of the Quebec construction market and make those jobs unattainable to Ontario workers. Minister, will you and your Eastern Ontario colleagues Liberal support the policy. Fairness is a Two-Way Street Act and work with me and the people of Eastern Ontario to try to open the door to fair trade with Quebec, here, here. or here. failing that, slam the door shut. The Attorney General is now uh, inches away from being warned, and if he says one more word, he will be. The member from Nepean Carleton, I would like you to come to a, a order, please, because I'm in the middle of chastising somebody over here. So just and uh, those kind of comments are not wanted either. <laughs> Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I think, Speaker, what we need to really focus on is, is, is developing and building cooperation and fairness for both provinces. And that's exactly what the 2006 Labour Mobility Agreement between Ontario and Quebec ha had done. It had resolved years of disputes over construction, labour mobility, 
Now, Speaker, under the agreement, qualified Ontario uh, construction workers can also work in Quebec. Not to mention, Speaker, under the agreement, the Jobs Protection Office uh, works with Ontario workers in ensuring to help resolve a dispute. Let me try it again. Order. In 2009, we, uh, we started a Head Start program uh, to ensure that we work with Ontario workers in, in uh, creating opportunities for them in Quebec. The speaker, there will be a five-year effectiveness Answer. study that will be uh, uh, being worked at as a result of their agreement. I think we should wait for that study to see what evidence we can decipher from it over the Thank last you. five years and then work on it further. Thank, Thank you. you. The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Two years ago, former Premier Dalton McGuinty took a pretty simple position on the Senate. This is what he said. Ontario's position on Senate reform? Abolish the Senate. Why has the Premier abandoned that position? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is a pleasure to have the member for Ottawa. to my colleague that my position is actually that that um, chamber of uh, sober second thought I don't think is a bad idea, Mr. Speaker. Do I think it needs to be reformed? Absolutely. I think that there are definitely reforms that should take place, and that should be a conversation across the country, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Three votes. You know, Canadians watching the series of Senate scandals unfold uh, don't think that appointed senators, especially those who abuse their privilege, represent Canadians' interests or their values. And until today, their government seemed to agree. Again, I'm going to quote the former Premier, Dalton McGuinty. He said, quote, I think frankly, to reform it in any substantive way is just not possible. Wow. I just don't think we need a second, unelected, unaccountable body. Why has the Premier abandoned that reasonable position? <laughs> South and I would categorically agree on is that there is no tolerance for abuse of taxpayers' Here, dollars, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Oh. As you can tell, I kind of let that one play itself out. <laughs> Premier will wrap up. <laughs> but there's so much to say, Mr. Speaker. I, 
You know, I am, I am pleased that the leaders or that the members of the opposition have such enthusiastic energy. I, Mr. Speaker, I do believe that where there is abuse of taxpayers' dollars, we have to respond and we have to be held accountable. I've made that very clear. On the issue of the Senate, Mr. Speaker, Answer. I believe that it is possible to reform the Senate. I believe that the abuses, that the uh, discussion at the federal level is unacceptable. We need to have that discussion across the country. We do have a deferred vote on the budget motion. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
The members take their seats, please. Thank you. On May 2, 2013, Mr. Souza moved, seconded by Ms. McWynn, that the House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. All those in favour of the motion, uh, Mr. Souza, motion, please please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mrs. Jeffrey. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. McGinty. Mr. McGinty. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Mr. Crater. Mr. Crater. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Picard. Mr. Picard. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Ms. Broughton. Ms. Broughton. Ms. Cansfield. Ms. Cansfield. Mr. Balkasen. Mr. Balkasen. Mr. Padre. Mr. Padre. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Besson. Mr. Besson. Ms. Genova. Mr. Genova. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Fru. Mr. Fru. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Sam. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Duffy. The ayes being 65 and the nays being 36, I declare the motion carried and is therefore resolved that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.